I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So everybody should be able to see my screen now. And what we're going to start with is PowerPoint presentation. So what are we talking about in Module 1? In Module 1, we are talking about the basics of what it takes to create a program. And then we're going to be building on these basics over the next eight weeks to the point where you guys are going to be able to write your own text-based game. So we're going to be talking about what is programming, what are variables, what are types, and a little bit about strings. So what is a program? Well, a program is really three basic steps. You have input, process, and output. Input is where you add data to a program. Process is what you do with it, okay? Mathematical stuff, we're playing a game, I'm entering what my direction is, which it will be for the project later, and you're going to do something with that. That's what process is. And output is you are providing information back to a user, back to another program. So that's what output, and those are the three basic steps. And if you can remember those three basic steps, am I doing input, am I doing process, or am I doing output, it will be easier to learn to program. So what's a variable? A variable is a container. It stores information. It stores data. And a variable has three properties. It has a name. You can call it Fred. You can call it X. Um, it's going to store something. So when you create a variable, you are actually carving out a place in memory, and you're going to put a piece of information in that memory. And then every time you want to get that piece of information, you can use the name of the variable to get it. Um, and a variable exists in a specific scope. For right now, we only have to worry about the global scope. I want to introduce it now because later we're going to be talking more about scope. So how do I define a variable? Well, I give it a name. Then I have a value, but I have to associate the value with the name. And the way I do that is through an assignment operator. It is a single equal sign. And what you will hear me say probably incessantly over the next probably two to three weeks, and then I'll stop saying it, is that I know it's a variable because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of the single equal sign is, in fact, the value. So that single equal sign is important. And I say single equal sign because in week three, we're going to learn about a double equal sign. So this is what kind of the storage looks like for Python. The name is amount, and the value is 10. And Python actually carves that out of memory in the computer. So there are four types of variables. There's a string, an integer, a float, and a Boolean. Now, Booleans we're not going to deal with until week three. But for module one and module two, you need to know what a string is, what an integer is, and what a float is. A string, just an ordered collection of letters. And characters, I really should have said, because a space is part of an ordered collection. A quote can be part of an ordered collection. An integer is a whole number. It's 11. It's 42. And a float is a number with a decimal point. It's just like if you were doing math. Okay? It, it's an integer. It's a float. They're very easy to understand. There's nothing different about it than in Python than it is in the world of math. So... 
one thing to remember, and it is a place where students get tripped up on, especially in the beginning, is that if you are using a method called input, which we will get to momentarily, then Python is going to assume that anything that comes back from that function is a string. So every time you enter data into Python, it is going to say it's a string, which means if I enter the number 11 in Python and I want to use it in, in math, then I have to convert it. So there are going to be conversion functions that we'll use and we'll get to them soon. And by the way, you'll see down here in the slides, there's an associated script called variable.py and a Zybooks reference, which will tell you where to find it in Zybooks. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to stop the presentation and then we're going to go to variable py and take a look at what some of the things are that I'm talking about. So, whoops. Okay. Come on. There we go. So what I'm bringing up here is PyCharm. PyCharm is the tool that you are going to use to program all of your assignments. And you're going to have to install it in week two. I need to turn off notifications real quick. Uh, there we go. Um, you're going to have to use it starting in week two. So I start introducing it in week one. PyCharm is a programming environment for Python. And it is, um, it's, it's a standard, it's free. There is a community edition that you can use. I think I just saw somebody ask a question. Can you expand PyCharm, please? Do I need to make the, the, the letters bigger? Probably do. How's that? Is that better? I'm going to assume that's better. Um, sorry. Let me, let me take a look at this. Ah, good. Okay. So this is a Python file. The Python file is named variable.py. It's down here under a project that I created called Module 1. And we can actually learn next week how to create a project. Um, and it has some lines of code in it. Now, one of the reasons I like to use PyCharm is because we can walk through the debugger and actually see what's happening in the code. And I find that to be very helpful. There are some people, some people that I work with, who can read about a programming language and it all falls into place in their head. I'm not one of those people. I have to physically see what's going on. So this, let me edit the configuration so we can actually look at this run. Hold on. Variable. OK. So this is a Python script. That's what variable.py is. And what this has in it is some lines of code. And those lines of code do things. Now, there's a couple different ways we can run this. I can hit this little run button up here and it will run variable and you'll see that it printed stuff to the screen. But, and I will be using this a lot during class. I can debug this. So I can put a breakpoint, that's that red box, and that red dot, and that red dot tells PyCharm to stop. So, because I want to see what's going on. So if I hit the debugger for variable.py and we look down here at the bottom of the screen, we can see there's a console and variables. I don't know why it's looking like that. But anyway, so right now there's nothing under variables, which means no variables have been defined. But here I have a name, my var, 
I have an assignment operator equals, and I have the value 10. So on line 3 of my Python script, I am going to assign the value 10 to my var. So let's see what happens when I step over this. When I step over this, and I go back to variables, no, nope, sorry, no, nope, my bad, let me step over it. I now see my var equals int 10, and I'm sorry this stuff down here is so small. Now, my var is the name of the variable, right there, same thing. The value is 10, and it's telling me it is a type integer, which means I can do math with it. If it told me it was something different other than an int or a float, I couldn't do math with it. Now, here is a function called print, and we're going to talk about this in a little more detail in a minute. It's the way you get information back to the console. Okay? Now, I'm going to print. Yep, let's see. Why did it not count it as a string? It didn't count it as a string because I didn't use the input. So this is just my var equal 10. When I did it like this inside Python, Python knew that 10 is an int. I could have done, and I'll show you in a second, I could have made it a string. And when we go to input, when we go to using the input function, you'll see that it will come in as a string. But because I didn't use input, Python knew what it was. Yes, print is pretty much equivalent to echo, except with print, you can do some pretty cool formatting stuff. Yes, Patrick, a string needs to be in quotes. And sometimes we're going to put them in quotes explicitly, and sometimes Python's going to assume. So right now, I have my var equals 10. And I'm going to step over. And what it's going to do at the console, it's going to print 10 with a space at the end. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And now I'm going to say my var equal 12. But well, wait a minute, I already said my var equal 10. Well, all this is going to do is it's going to change the value of my var. So I'm going to step over again. I can see that my var is now equal 12. It's an integer. And I'm going to print it again. So I'm going to step over and on the console, it's going to print 12. Now you'll see there's a 10 space 12. And then I'm going to step over it. And then it's going to print 1, 2, 3 because it came to this line. And we'll talk about that line in a little bit. But I wanted to introduce to you what a script could look like and begin the discussion of talking about PyCharm. What is a step over? Good question, Joseph. So in PyCharm, which is, by the way, PyCharm is an integrated development environment for Python, IDE. So in most IDEs, you can either run, run the whole thing like this. So this little button is run, and variable is the name of my PyCharm script and I just ran everything. Or I can debug it, which means I can actually see what's happening at every line of code. And right now, this may not seem like a really neat thing, but when you start getting into branching and looping and more complex programs, it's a huge benefit to be able to actually see what's going on line by line. So if I hit this little thing up here that looks like a bug, and you'll see debug if you hover over it. Down here, all this stuff changes, and I get this control bar up here. Now, the only one we're going to worry about is step over, and that just tells PyCharm to execute the line of code that I am currently sitting on. So the red button said 
stop here. Hey, Pie Charm, don't go past here until I tell you to by either telling you to step in or step over. I know what line of code I'm on because it's a blue line. This is, this is the only time you're going to see this blue line. And this blue line is because the interpreter for Python has stopped on that line of code. And it's not going to execute it and you tell, until you tell it explicitly to execute it. So step over means execute the line of code and go to the next line of code. So I do that. By the way, the other nice thing with PyCharm is it tells you up here what's happening. Let me... Okay, and I... Um, Dariel, we will get to exactly what that end means in a minute to introduce you. I didn't want to go through all the slides and then go back and go through all of the scripts. I wanted to intermix them. So there's a few things we haven't gone over yet, but we will. So I'm just going to keep stepping over each line of code. That's all I'm doing. I'm saying execute this line of code and go to the next. So that's what that is. A absolutely great, Kendall. Very good. Um, there's a couple good ways to practice coding with Python. You can go to PyCharm, Code Academy. Apparently has, I have never used it, but some students have said that Code Academy has great practices for Python. Um, so those are some of the good ways to practice that I've heard about. So we're going to go and start and go to the next slide. Okay, converting types. Down here is this iBooks reference. It's section 1.13. And there's convert.py, which we're going to go to in a minute. You can convert one type to another. So I can say, oh, I have a string that's 11, but I want to use it as an integer. And the only way to do that is to tell Python, hey, I know you've got this thing as a, a, a set of characters, because that's what a string is, but I want you to really turn it into an integer because I know it's an integer. Or I want to turn a, a string into a float. Or I can turn anything into a string. Now, it's important because when you do the output stuff, all your stuff's going to have to be strings. So that what converting types is. You can change one type to another, except for Boolean. You can take a, change a string to an integer or a float. You can change an integer to a string or a float to a string. And you can change an integer to a float, but you don't have to do that explicitly. Python will do that for you. Let's say you multiply an integer times a float, you will always get a float. So that's an implicit type conversion. So let's stop for a minute. Debugging allows you to go through each line to check for errors. Yes, it does. It also it allows you to check for logic errors and syntax errors. Um, for students that are more hands-on learning, I would suggest that you go to a site like Code Academy or you, um, well, from, from the class perspective, you can do the challenges. Now, just to, just to bring this topic up, the challenges are not required for this class. It is strongly encouraged that you do the challenges, but they're not required for the class. So if you're worried, if, if you're in a time crunch and you're concerned about your grade, you don't have to do the challenges. You only have to do, the only things that are graded in Zybooks are the activities and the labs. That's what you have to do. So if you are more hands-on, one of the things you can do from, a, from the perspective of the class is 
simply do the challenges. Work through the challenges to get the right information. That is a more hands-on way. Go to a place like Code Academy. That's a more hands-on way. I don't know of any other sites than Code Academy for free hands-on tutorials. Um, but I think between those two, and by the way, I am a much more hands-on learner. I'm not one of those people who can figure it out just by reading a book. Okay, that's okay. All right, I struggling means that you're learning some. Um, and we will go over the lab. And if you want to, before we end this class, we can go out and work through a challenge or two that are, are causing you struggles. Okay? So, you know, vote for the challenges that you want to do. Maybe we'll pick two and we'll go through those challenges at the end of the class so that um, you can struggle less. Let's see. Um, so the labs and assignments are auto-graded by Zybooks. Now, I don't know. Um, I will go through lab 1.10. We won't code it, but I will go through the process of it. In fact, I'm going to go through the process of all of the um, labs. Um, the auto-grading. So, so here's the requirement for the teachers. For the activities, the participation activities, Zybooks gives us a grade, and we, we're supposed to use that grade. For the labs, and, and I know this for my class, I cannot answer for any other professor. I go through and I look at the labs, especially the labs where students have not been able to um, complete the lab 100% successfully. And what I do is I go through that and I look to see if what kind of effort has been put into it. How close are you? And I will provide partial credit. But also, Zybooks provides partial credit. So even if you don't get it 100% right and you, there were 10 test cases and you got 6 out of 10 test cases, you still get 60% of the points for that. So always try the labs. Always try them. Get the activities done first. Any of the labs that are easier to do, do those labs first. You're looking for low-hanging fruit. What's the easiest for you to get your points? And then go back on the harder things and do those. So that's kind of my take on the class. Yes, you're very true. Whoever said Stack Overflow, you are very true. I live on Stack Overflow. That's one of the best things that I use when I'm looking up very technical things. Um, so, yes, David, that's very true. Okay, so submitting... Um, so the um, sub what you're submitting for grading, okay? There is kind of two parts to that question. You can do the activities and the labs over and over and over again in any given week. And you won't be graded down for that at all. You can do the activities and then come back later and try some other activities and I can't um, answer for anybody else other than my class. I, as the professor in this class, do not have a problem if any programmer in my class goes out to PyCharm, goes out to Python.org, or goes out to Google and looks for help in figuring out a specific aspect of a lab. Because I do that as a programmer. I'm writing a paper right now. On, on some very technical things that um, we're being required to answer for our, one of our customers. So I have to go out and I have to research some of those highly technical cryptographic things. 
I go out on the Internet and because I don't know everything about that. And I don't expect you to know everything about that, at least in my class. So go out and Google. If you're in my class, email me if you have a question. I can't answer for any other professor. I can only tell the people in my class what I do. I never downgrade a student because they went out and went above and beyond. So if you find a more efficient and better way to do to get the right answer, I applaud you. Go and do that. I will never grade you down because you decided to go out and find a module and import it and do it in one line of code instead of four. So, but for all the students, I cannot speak to other professors. Um, so I hope that answered the question about how many times. And though the second part of that question is, you can then go out and um, you have two additional weeks to go back and change things. And you will get taken off. There will be late points taken off. So you kind of have to weigh. But if you are having a lot of problems in a given week, you have two additional weeks to kind of add points back. So remember that. Um, the only time the attempts are limited on the labs is after you submit them. But I still actually think you can submit them multiple times. Yes, you can see your progress. Yeah, Stack, Over Stack Overflow is great. OK, so what is Stack Overflow? Stack Overflow is um, a website. OK, this is Stack Overflow, OK? It is, you can join the community. You don't have to even sign up. What you can do is you can search Stack Overflow for, and this just tells you what's been searched for. It is a resource for programmers. I often go to Stack Overflow and look for obscure programming things that I'm trying to deal with. Um, and if you search through Google for something, oftentimes you will end up at Stack Overflow. So I say Python um, input function. Let's see what I come up with. Well, I come up with W3 Schools, which is a good resource. Oh, I didn't really, I didn't really formulate a good questions for Stack Overflow. Sorry about that. Um, Let's see. I think study groups are great, but always remember, if you're doing a study group, you need to make sure that when it comes down to your work, your work is uniquely yours. If you are in a study group and you are in my class, and I notice the two students have identical code, okay, in labs, I'm going to question whether or not they've actually shared their resources. So while some of the labs, especially in the earlier days, they should be identical. When you start to get into the more, um, the more detailed labs, and I see two, two, three, four labs that are identical, again and again and again, I'm going to start to wonder if students are sharing the lab work. So for my, for my class, study group away. Work together with anybody else you want to work with. When it comes to the labs and the assignments, your work has to be wholly your own. Um, OK. OK. So what the prof will see on her and Kendra, if your last Submission was 100%. That's what the professor will see on her end. She will see 100. Professor, he or she will see um, 100%. Um, so the way it works in terms of grading, David, is that Zybooks calculates a grade. Okay, and for the activities, we always take the grades. However. The professor at SNHU has some latitude. And it's always up to the professor. For me, the latitude is if I see a student who has attempted 
a lab. Maybe you didn't get 100% on it. I'm going to go back and look. And if the reason they didn't get 100% on it is that they were missing a space, I'm going to provide, I'm going to up the grade because the code is there, but Zybooks didn't necessarily catch that they were only missing a space. Zybooks, when it, when it grades, it's looking for exact answers. So if you're missing a space, if you're missing a decimal place, then you're going to have a problem in Zybooks. So for me, I go back and I look. Um, so I think I've answered all the questions. And where were we? Sorry, i got to go back and look. Where were we? We were converting types, and I'm going to go to convert.py, and this class is probably going to go past 10. So let's go to convert.py and talk about converting things. Okay. So <laughs> I have to work tomorrow. I'm not going till midnight, David. <laughs> okay. So let's go back and talk about converting. Okay, so here's an input function, and we're going to go in detail into the input function in a minute. Let's see. Is the higher grade taken down out of multiple lab submissions? If those lab submissions are within the week that the lab is due, there is no markdown for multiple submissions. The teacher won't even know you've done multiple submissions unless they actually go back in and search for your particular solution in Zybooks. Um, okay, when that happens in Zybooks, is that where syntax errors come from? Not necessarily. Syntax errors, yes, the labs are due on Sunday. Um, syntax errors come from not understanding the syntax you will actually, your program won't even completely run if there's a syntax error. What will, what will happen is oftentimes you'll have logic errors. So your syntax will be perfect, but the program still won't work. And the program won't work because something happened. We don't know what the something happened was, and that's where you have to go and look. And in past courses, I have had students copy their Zybooks code into PyCharm to check through the debugger where the logic error is. Now, in the first week or two, that's not really necessary. But when you start to get into week three and we start to talk about more complex topics like branching and looping, it becomes a really valuable tool. And I will have students email and say, hey, PyCharm worked, but Zybooks didn't. What's going on? And then we can look at what's going on, what's the, what is difference between theirs and Cybooks. Um, so again, I can't answer for any other professor, but for my class, if you come to an issue where you're sure that it's right and Zybooks is saying it's wrong, email me. Okay? We can talk about what's going on and figure out what Zybooks, you know, is not communicating well. Okay. So... We are here, all right, one more, and then I'm going to go back to the program. What do we copy and paste again? Sorry. Okay, Robert, what I was talking about is sometimes Zybooks doesn't have a good environment for figuring out what's wrong with your code for a lab. So you can actually copy what you've written in Zybooks and paste it into a, 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 a file in PyCharm and run it in PyCharm. It's just Python. And you can sometimes walk through it in PyCharm using the debug function and figure out where your logic is. So that's what I was talking about with copy and paste. And I can show you that next week because um, it will become more important as we move through. So convert.py, we were talking about converting. Um, one type of variable to another. And here I'm going to use the input because I want you to see how that works and we're going to go in depth into what input is in just a minute. Um, okay. 
So I'm going to, first of all, in PyCharm, I have to give it the Python script for the configuration. So I always edit my configuration. And in this case, I'm going to do convert.py. And now I can run this. So I'm going to debug it because that's my preferred mode. And I'm going to set off the debugger. And I am here at the first line. I'm here at line four. And I'm going to use the input function so I can type in information. And Python will get that information. And that's the purpose of the input function. It's to allow me to type in information and Python to get it. So let's see what happens when I step over this piece of code. Now when I step over, you'll notice there's no blue line. And that's because Python is waiting for me to do something. I have says something, please enter an integer down here on the console. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter the number 11. And then Python shows up here at line 7. So when I hit the enter key, that 11 went from here that I had typed it in down here on the console into, uh, sorry, into Python. And Python has my stir. It's a type string and it is 11. And you can also see that up here. Now, I know it's a string visually when I look at it because it's inside quotes. I will never be able to use an 11 inside quotes as a, in, in, in mathematics. So I have to convert it. And the way I convert it is to use something called the int function. The int function just says take a string and make it an integer. That's all it does. I have the name of the function. I have an argument and I have my parentheses. And again, we're going to go through that in a little more detail in just a few minutes. So I'm going to step over this, and now I have two variables. I have my int, which is a type int, and it is the number 11. And I still have my stir, and it is a string, and it is 11. So now I'm going to do that again. I'm going to, and I've, I'm on line 9. We know I'm on line 9 because it's blue. I'm going to step over. Again, there's no blue line after I step over because it was an input function. I need to actually enter. Python's waiting for me to do something. So I'm going to enter 3.14 as my float. And I know that's hard to see. I apologize. I'm going to hit the Enter key. And after I hit the Enter key, what you will see is my stir 2 is 3.14. Whoops shouldn't have done that, but I think I'm okay. And then I'm going to step over my float. Oops, sorry, I should have. Here. Let me do this. So we can actually see it. So let me debug this again. I'm just going to run it because we already saw the first part. Console, please, at 11. A float, 3.14. So now I'm here. Let me go back to the variables. When I step over, I have a line to go to. Before, I didn't have some place for it to land on, so it stopped the program. Now I have a float called my float, which is 3.14, as opposed to a string, which is 3.14. So that is converting. Yes, David, I do these web calls as much as I can every Thursday. Sometimes I end up traveling for work and I'm not available on a Thursday night, but I generally put out an email to all the professors. I, I put an email out to all the professors every week announcing that there's going to be one. And if there's not, I put an email out that directs students to my YouTube channel, which has previous lectures uh, for all of the sessions. Um, and I will also post these recorded lectures to my YouTube channel. Um,
Um, yes, I'm going to put all of the scripts that I created in PyCharm in the description uh, with this video on my YouTube channel. They will all be there sometime tomorrow or tomorrow evening. So, um, so let me put my YouTube channel up there again. So that's the URL to my YouTube channel. Um, I use com free conference call for all of my um, for all of my lectures. So let's go back and continue on. So the secret life of a Python script. Probably should have done this before I started looking at the actual Python. So every script has every script you have to start. I run it or debug it in PyCharm or Zybooks runs it when you say run. The first thing I'm always going to do is I'm going to input information. So in some cases it might just be x equal 2 and y equal 4. Then I'm going to do something with that information. That's called processing. So I'm going to have area equals x times y. That is, in fact, a statement, or sorry, an expression. And then I'm going to do something with it. I'm going to output it someplace. And then the program is going to end, and that's what we just saw. So now I want to talk about input and output, which we already saw in that last program. And this becomes important because they're going to be using words in the labs like input or output. And you want to know, you want that to trigger what you have to do in Python. So input is a special function provided by Python. Get it for free. Um, and it allows user to add data to a running script, which is what we just did. Print is a special function, and it allows you to display data to the screen that a user has um, that a user that, well, sorry, that the process or the script wants to be displayed. So how to call the input function. There are two ways to call the input function. One is with an argument and one is without. So this is the way you call it without an argument. You have a variable name. You have the assignment operator because what we're doing is we are assigning the result from the input function to a variable because we're going to want to use it later. Okay? I have the function name, which is input, all lowercase. I have an opening parenthesis and I have a closing parenthesis. Now, the second way to call it is with an argument. And again, I have the variable name because uh, I'm going to want to use this piece of data again. I've got to store it someplace. I have the assignment operator, I have the name of the function, I have uh, an open parenthesis, then I have an argument, then I have a closing parenthesis. So you see a couple patterns here. One of them is that you've got these open and closing parentheses, and one of them is that I'm always going to assign the result from the input statement to a variable. Okay, so here's a rule. For every open parenthesis, you must have a closed parenthesis. Okay, it's called being balanced, and if you don't, you will get a syntax error. So always, if you're having some, if, if you've got a syntax error on uh, an input or a print or any other function call, first Always check that your parentheses are balanced. You have the same number of opening parentheses as you do closing parentheses. Okay, how to call the print function. The print function can be called with a single argument or it can be called with two arguments. So the first way to call it is with a single argument. Now you'll notice in this line of code that I wrote that there's no assignment to a variable because there's no output from print. There's no way to get anything in from print back into the program. Print is all about output. Print is all about directed out of the script. So we have the function name. 
have an open parenthesis, we have an argument, we have a closed parenthesis. All right, now we can call it with two arguments. We have the name of the function, which is print, open parenthesis, the first argument, a comma, the second argument, and a closed parenthesis. So, and I'm probably going to sound a little bit repetitive here when I'm talking about parentheses and arguments, but it is important that we remember the order because it's going to help us not have as many syntax errors later. So, we have our rule that for every open parenthesis, you must have a closed parenthesis. And now we have a second rule. Arguments are separated by commas. So, if I have argument one, and argument two, there has to be a comma in between the two. So those are the two rules. So let's go look at simple input and output and then simple print. Sorry, simple input and simple print. What's going on here? Um, there are no dumb questions, Michael. It doesn't matter if it's a single quote or if it's a double quote. But if you start with a single quote, you have to end with a single quote. And if you start with a double quote, you have to end with a double quote. So that's important. And if you have quotes inside of quotes, you have to do some escape things. No bad. There's no, nothing bad, Kendall. It's all good. Yes, as long as they match. Um, so where were we? Okay, we're going to look at some more. We're going to look at simple input. So we actually already did this. I'm not going to really do this because we did it in the last program. Simple print here. Okay. Um, no problem. <laughs> yes. You, you, can, you ha may have to deal with some escape things. And we won't really talk about that much now, but we can. All right, so this is just different ways of outputting things, okay? I can print the word hello. I can print it again. I can print hello with an ending that is a space. That's different. Um, the print function always puts a new line by default after everything you print. So it's like a carriage return. It's like you hit the enter key on your keyboard or the return key on your keyboard until um, you tell it not to. And the way we tell it not to oftentimes is with this end equal quote space quotes. And that's basically said, hey, print function, hey, Python, with the print function, don't put a new line there. Put this instead. So if I run this, Uh, simple print and I'm just going to run it and you will see that I have hello hello again and there's a new line between these two and then I have hello after special end and you'll see I have hello and then I have after special end so as two different print statements so the end makes you put a space between them rather than a new line. Oh, bigger. I'm sorry. Let me make that bigger. Is that better? Or are you talking about the console output? Could you write all that in argument. Do you mean, Michael, in a single argument? Okay. Without the end. Yes, I could do that as a single one. Um, it's important to know that the end exists because you're going to have labs where you're actually in a loop and you're going to have to not have a new line. You're going to have to have something else. So we're introducing it now. Um, and what you're exactly right. What was in that script, I could have just put it all on one line. But there are instances where you won't be able to. 
So um, it's important to remember that you can change the ending. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Okay, sorry, we just did all this. Go to the next one. Okay, where does input and print fit? And I'm, I'm answering this question because when we go through the labs, you need to remember what what terminology goes along with what functionality in Python. So I have my input process and output. I'm going to start input process output. End. So an example is of input is input please enter a value. An example of output is output ends in a new line or output ends in a, in a space. So, and I know I'm harping on this, but it, it's one of the areas that students get stuck. So we want to talk about statements and expressions. So again, we have our input process and output. Um, and so what we have is we have a statement, which is, please enter an integer. And another statement that says, please enter an integer. Okay? Those are statements. And this is more nomenclature. Um, it's important to understand the difference between a statement and an expression. An expression, I'm doing something with the data that I have. Okay? I'm doing a calculation. I'm running through um, a loop somewhere. And then print is a statement, I'm going to print the area. So this is just a simple script where you would take in information and print out the area. Okay, cases and spaces matter. Python is a case sensitive language, and it is a space delimited language. That's important because people start to get frustrated. And the frustration isn't because they don't understand the logic, the, the frustration is that they have a case wrong in a variable name and all of a sudden things don't work. So what I mean by case sensitive is that if you have a lower case x equal 2, it is not the same as a bigger case x equal 2. Those are not the same variables in Python. They're different variables. This is a lower case, that's an upper case. So what does it mean to be space delimited? Space delimited means that Python knows the end of a line of code, the end of an, a statement or an expression because there's a new line after it. And when we get into weeks three, four, and so on, there's also going to be indentation that becomes important. Right now, everything is less, less justified. In week three, that, that changes. So I have x equal two and y equal 4. That is completely valid Python. Here if I have x equal 2 and y equal 4, notice there's a space and now a new line. That is a syntax error. So cases and spaces. Python is a case sensitive space delimited language. Always remember that. Okay, so I'm going to go and look um, Yes, you can have more than two arguments in a print function. Yeah, you're right, Patrick. Everything has to be separated by a comma. Okay, so we'll talk about it a little more later, but the colon is a way, it's like a question mark. When we were writing a sentence or a question, we put a question mark after it, David. The colon is equivalent to that question mark. Well, you can. You can put, Matthew, you can have your code all lowercase, your variable names all lowercase. You can have your variable names all uppercase. You can have them camel case. But you have to make sure that the right, um, that, that you understand that if 
you have a variable with its all lowercase and then another variable of the exact same letters but uppercase, they're going to be different variables. So let's look at, where is it? Cases and spaces. Okay. So here you'll see I have my example, lowercase x equal to, uppercase x equal to. Let's run this in the debugger really quick. Okay. Cases and spaces. Okay. So I'm going to run this in the debugger, and I want to look specifically at the variables down here. Uh, wait a minute. That's not what I wanted. I want to look at the variables down here. Okay, we're going to stop this. And we're going to debug it. There we go. No. Okay, my pie charm is messed up again. I don't know why it's having that problem. So we'll just talk through this, and I'll figure it out before I put it up. So you have a lowercase x and an uppercase x. Those are two different variables. Here we have a lowercase x and a lowercase y separated by a new line. That's perfectly good. And then x equal 2 and y equal 4 um, is not valid. And in PyCharm it will give you this, this little red wiggly line. Okay. Yes. Garris, the, um, there are actually organizations who have um, policies, who have style policies, style guides, which say this is how you should name your variables, and it should be camel case, it should be under case, with, with batches or um, underscores. So there is a style guide that some companies have. Um, my company doesn't have a hugely... Um, overarching style guide. It just has to be readable. So it all depends, and it depends on what's readable to you. Um, and, and so that is my basic suggestion, what's readable to you. Um, which program are you using? So do you mean this one? This is PyCharm. PyCharm, you will have to install next week, and you will have your your assignment for week two is to install this, and basically do a print hello from it. So let's continue on. These are the lab overviews that I have. So let's go through and take a look at them, and then I promise afterwards, um, if you want to go through some challenges, just give me a couple of challenges and we'll work through them together. So I wanted to go through these because I want to start to help you understand how to read these problems. These are word problems, they're requirements. You go out and become a software engineer, you're going to read word problems all the time. So how do we read these? So for example, Lab 1.9 says complete the program to read four values from input. So they're telling you to use the input statement and then store the variable, store the values and variables, first name, generic location, whole number, and plural noun. The program will use these input values to output, sorry, went to the wrong one, there we go, to output a short story. And the output is actually provided in Zybooks, and we'll look at that in a second. But the flow of that program is that it starts as always. And by the way, these are these are going are looking like something you will have to do in week three, which are flow charts. So I also want to kind of get you used to looking at them. So we're going to input the first name. My apologies. Uh, Sorry about that. Okay. We're going to input the first name, first underscore name. We're going to input generic underscore location, whole underscore number, and plural underscore noun. And we're going to output what's provided in Zybooks. So let's go to Zybooks really quick and look at that lab. So lab 1.9 is here. 
And what they've provided is on line five here, okay? And it's just a, a long print statement, and the print statement, by the way, someone was asking, can you have multiple arguments? Yes, you can. Here you have variable first name, comma, and then the string went to, and then comma, generic location, and then comma, to by. And by the way, I think you're going to have to put spaces there. But anyway, so when I'm looking at this, what I need to do is I need to have input statements for four variables. And those variables in this case have to be named exactly what is in this print statement. So it's going to be first underscore name, and you're going to have an input statement afterwards. Generic undersc underscore location, input statement. Whole underscore number, input statement. Plural underscore noun. If you do not have your variables named exactly, then this won't work. And if you don't use input statements, it won't work. So you have to have input statements in there. Um, and I think I actually have an example of Lab 1.9. This is a partial example for Lab 1.9. And this is what you have to do. And it's important also to remember that in Zybooks, 99% of the time, there's never going to be an argument inside the input statement. And if you put one in there, Zybooks will take off points. So in this case, I have first underscore name equals input. And then generic underscore location equals input. And then I have first name went to generic location. So let's run this short program that's similar to 1.9 through the debugger. Come on, computer. OK. So if I do that. I start the debugger, I get to the first name, I'm going to step over, and I'm. it's just going to wait here. So I'm going to say my first name is Lisa, and that's waiting for generic location, and the generic location will be Oz, Oz, that's a Z, and then Oh, wait a minute. I didn't step over. My bad. Okay. So then it's going to be print first name went to generic location to buy. And my brain is shutting down. Okay. Lisa went to Oz to buy. So you'll see that first name is first name. Generic location is generic location. So if you expand this, into the other two variables and the remainder of the print function, you should not have any problems with the lab. OK. When you mean input statement, do you mean input open print? Yes. I'm calling the input function. So when I say input statement, it means I'm calling the input function so it's input, open, close, parentheses, open parentheses, close parentheses. OK. So Zybooks will take points off oftentimes for spaces because it's looking for an exact string match, and it can get very frustrating. Do you have to do four lines for it to work? Yes. You have to have four input statements, four separate input statements for this to work. OK, so for Zybooks, you won't actually put anything in. Zybooks is going to put it in. So you're just going to write the code, and then you're going to run the program. And when you run the program, it's going to display the output here when you in develop mode. When you go into submit mode, PyCharm is going to run your script multiple times with different data to see if it really works well. and that's normal, and it's what we do as programmers. We actually spend a good part of our day writing test code that actually goes out and tests the code that we wrote, and it makes for a higher quality product. So that's what's going to happen. 
when I'm showing it to you in PyCharm, I'm doing it because I can't show it to you in Zybooks. I share this Zybooks with all the other professors that are teaching IT 140. So if I go out and change it, it changes it for all the professors. So it's not like you guys who have your own individual Zybooks. This is a shared Zybook. So I cannot show you what's happening in Zybook. What I can do is I can explain it to you through PyCharm. I can explain the process through PyCharm. So that's the difference of what's going on when I show it to you in PyCharm and what's going to happen when you do it in Zybook. Okay. Um, We will review it. I have reviews for all of the different um, yeah, I have we're going to review all of the different labs. Um, my suggestion is to um, try it out in Zybooks first, Michael. And then if you start to have problems, you start to have syntax errors, put it in PyCharm. And then use the debugger in PyCharm and then send it back to Zybooks. Copy and paste it back into Zybooks. So that's what I would suggest. So let's go look at the next one. And I'll make it bigger. So now we have lab 1.10. So they're talking about a variable called user num. And you're going to store, you can store a value like an integer. So and what they want you to do is, and what they don't say explicitly here is, you got to have to have an input statement for user num. And then you're going to have to convert it to an integer. Okay? So you're going to output the user's input. So what they want you to do for the first two points is output user num, just as it is. Then they want to output the input, so they want to output user num, squared and cubed. Okay? And then they want you to kind of do this again, but with user num2. So you're going to input to a variable called user num2, and you're going to output the sum in the product. So this requires a couple of things. Okay? What this requires is you have to input the value and you have to convert it, okay? This is where that type conversion comes in because you can't do arithmetic with a string. And because you're using the input statement, it's always going to be a string. So you're going to input things and output things and input things in a certain order and, and calculate them and then output them. So you input and convert to an integer. You output Sorry, you input user num and convert it to an integer. You output user num. Then you're going to output user num times user num. And because of this output, you have to have done the conversion, or you're going to get a type error. And I will show you what that looks like in a minute. Then you're going to input user num2 and convert it to an integer. And then you're going to output user num2 plus user num2. And then you're going to output user num2 times user num2 and then the program's going to end. So let's take a quick look. Yes. Um, it usually only lasts an hour. Um, I'm kind of, no one, we're not going till midnight. My brain actually at 10 o'clock starts to slow down. So it, I usually try and keep things to within an hour. Um, there's a lot of people and a lot of questions, and I want to get to what everyone has. If you cannot stay, that's completely fine. I will be here until the last question is answered, and it will be recording until the last question is answered. So this will all be on uh, YouTube. However, if everyone decides to drop off right now, I'll stop talking. So somebody's still got to be here. Anyway, so that's kind of how it works. I usually try and keep it to an hour, but there's a lot going on tonight, so we're going to go over. <coughs> so for 10, I also have a simple lab for 10, just to kind of give you guys a little bit of guidance. Okay, so here 
Um, so here I have enter a number. This is similar to 10. It's not the exact 10. And then I'm going to output that. Now here's something different that you haven't seen before. And here I am doing the conversion to an integer. At the same time, I'm doing the input. What this does is Python starts inside the deepest parentheses. So I have an integer function call, open and close parentheses, and inside that I have an input function call as my argument. And this is completely legal. I can absolutely do this. And I can let's edit the configuration. So I'm going to debug this. Okay. So here I am on line 13, and the rest of the lines are just mostly comments. I'm at the console. I'm going to step over. And it says enter a number. So I'm going to enter 12 just to enter it. And now I have user input is 12. I'm going to output my user input. And by the way, I know that it is an integer because there are no quotes in PyCharm. And if I go to the variables tab, it says it's an int. So I'm going to output or use the print function to output that. And then I'm going to say this is the user input. And then I'm going to input a float. That float is, and you don't actually have to do a float, but I wanted to show that it could be used. Um, so I'm going to step over that. The console, I'm going to do 3.14, hit the enter key, and then it's going to print a float. Kind of a little bit like 10, not exactly. But it tells you that this is completely valid and legal. You can convert on the same line that you input on. Now, I wanted to also show a couple of things. I wanted to show some errors, and I haven't gotten to that yet. So I'm going to, this code just worked fine. I'm going to remove a parenthesis. And all of a sudden in PyCharm, you see all of those nasty little red squiggles. Um, in Zybooks, you won't get that. But what you will get, and if I run this, you'll get something along these lines. You will get something that says invalid syntax. It will be a syntax error. And you're going to look at this print statement because it says, well, it's on this print line. And PyCharm just lied to you, and Python just lied to you, because the error isn't on this line. The error is on this line, and the issue is that I don't have a closing parenthesis. My parentheses aren't balanced. I have, I can count two open parentheses and only one closing parenthesis. And this is where it gets very, very confusing for new programmers because you're starting to look at this line that says, hey, it's line 14, but what's wrong with line 14? I don't get what's wrong with line 14. There's nothing wrong with line 14. So if you look at, if you look at the line number that you get from an error and that line looks correct, start reading backwards. Because when I fix line 13, all the red squigglies go away. And when I run it, I get the right answer. OK. 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 Tyler, if you're in my class, please send me an email. Um, and um, if you're not, I don't feel comfortable communicating with other teachers, students. The format and the the format that we see is actually um, a way of outputting variables so that um, you can 
so this basically says that the uh, squiggly braces say, hey, print, expect a, uh, expect a value. And then the colon dot to F says, expect that value to be a float and put two decimal places after the float. So make sure you only print out two decimal places. It could have 100 decimal places, but you're only going to print two. So that's what that means. It is a, a way of formatting your output, and we will do more of that as time goes on. It doesn't actually round. It truncates. So that formatting doesn't change the value. It only deals with the output, Michael. OK, so let's keep going. All right, so this is 2.21. Oops, my bad. Pardon me. I, should, I think I was trying to animate this, and I didn't get it all done. So let's just run through these. OK, so. 2.12 is write a programming using integers, user num, and x as input, and output user num divided by x three times. OK. So we're going to input and convert to an integer. We just saw how to do that. We're going to input x and convert to an integer. We just saw how to do that. Now I'm going to set user num equals user num divided by x. And I'm going to output it. I'm going to do it again. It's the same code, same exact same code, but you're going to have to copy the line. And you're going to say user num is user num divided by x and output. And then user num is user num divided by x and output it again. So that's the process of this program. Two inputs, three outputs, and three processes. OK, so you're going to. Set user num is user num divided by x three times. OK. So this is 2.12. And you're going to write a program using input, year, input age, weight, heart rate, and time, respectively. And you're going to output the average calorie you burned for a person. I'll put each floating point value with two digits after the decimal point, which can be achieved as follows. That, that, open squiggly brace, colon dot to F squiggly brace. And so what that does is that just because we're using floats as part of our calculation, and the calculation, by the way, is given to you in Zybook, you will you don't want to print out 100 decimal places after. You only want to print two, and that's what this does. So use the print statement as they've given it to you, and name the variable that you are using for the, the expression as calories. So you're going to input age and convert it to an integer. You're going to input weight and convert it to an integer. You're going to input heart rate and convert it to an integer. And then you're going to input time and convert it to an integer. So all of these are input and convert. And then you're going to set the variable calories equal to the expression provided by Zybooks. And you're going to output calories using that statement. So let's go real quick and see what Zybooks gives us. OK? So actually, let's do this. Um, divide by x. That's not the one that I want. Calories burned. So Zybooks is telling us what the calculation is. So, um, and this is where cases can matter. So if you want to use this line exactly, well, you can't use it because there's heart space rate, and you can't put a space in a variable name. But you want to use this but replace these with your variable names. And then you're going to want to use this print statement. So if you want this print statement to work, your, your calculation has to be, uh, sorry, the variable that's going to take the result of your calculation has to be lowercase calories. 
So you will have to do some work because this cannot be a valid variable name because there's a space in it. So, but that's why I kind of wanted to go here and show you. They're giving you some of this stuff. They're giving you the calculation. It is not valid Python syntax because the variable name heart rate isn't right. Yes, the operands need to be compatible. However, um, I'm glad the workflow seems helpful. The, um, the operands are pretty much the same as they are in math. I mean, you do have uh, modulo, and you do have the floor operator, which we're going to be using soon, which do not exist for normal mathematics, or at least as far as I know. Um, so let's go back and do 23. So here we have, we're going to prompt the user for input. It's going to be an integer between 23 and 126. Now this is important because of the ASCII table. Um, you're going to input a float, a character, and a string. And then you're going to output those four values on a single line separated by a space. Expand to also output in reverse, and then, sorry, extend to output in reverse, and extend to convert the integer to a character by using the, the care function. It's just like the int function or the float function, and then output that character. So, we're going to input um, an integer. So we have to input it and convert it to an integer. We're going to input a float and convert it to a float. We're going to input a character and we're going to input a string. So we're going to output those things in the order in which they came, separated by, uh, by a space. And then we're going to output them in reverse order, separated by a space. Then you're going to convert the user int to a character. So you're going to set it into a variable that is made for that conversion. And you're going to use it doing the chr function. And then you're going to output that character. And you're going to end. So these are the steps that you have to go through in order for lab.1.23. And the reason it's between 23 and 126 is because, um, I think it's in section 1.19. Yeah. Divide by x. Additional practice representing text. The reason they're saying between 32 and 126 is because of this thing called the ASCII table. Every character, whether it's a visible character or not, in um, in a program has a numeric value. So a space is the decimal 32. I know that kind of seems strange, but from a programming standpoint, everything is a series of zeros and ones. That's what it is. And so we have a representation to the screen that says it's a space, or it's the capital letter A. But to the program, it's just a series of ones and zeros. And those series of ones and zeros are going to be 32, or they're going to be 126, or they're going to be 65. So it is, um, it is just important to remember that every character you have has a numerical equivalent. And that's all this is trying to show you. That's all that lab is trying to get you to do. Um, and then here's some stuff with escape sequences, which we won't really work with right now. So I think that's pretty much it. Do you guys want to run through any challenges, or are we all burnt out? Uh, the operand would need to be compatible also correct. Yes. Multiply is the star, shift eight. I'm burnt too, Kendall. So if nobody has any challenges, we can call this.
Um, my brain is turning to mush as well. So I am going to say goodnight. And, um, oh, okay. If you want me to go through 1.34, I will go through 1.34. Um, yes, I'm going to upload this to my YouTube probably tomorrow. So anybody who doesn't want to stay along with me and Glory to work on the... Um, to work on the challenge doesn't have to, and then Glory, you and I will stay and work on the challenge. So that's what I'm going to do. 1.34. Um, I have a Mac, and I'm quite happy with PyCharm on a Mac. Um, PyCharm is made by JetBrains, and they do um, IDEs that run on any platform. Um, okay, so I'm going to start on challenge 1.34. Okay, 1.3, 1, 2, 3, verse 4. Oops. Okay, um, you meant challenge, that's participation activity. Participation, challenge, 1.33. Okay, I'm getting there. Brain's a little mushy right now. Um, 1.34. All right, let's work on this. Oops. Um, Garris, you can use greater than or equal to and less than or equal to or greater than and less than depending on whether or not the test is inclusive. And we will actually go through that in week three. So we're just going to work on this in PyCharm because I can't change it here. So I'm going to create a new file. Create a new Python file. I'm going to say 1.3.4. Copy that in. Make it a comment. Uh, oops. Get this. Come on. Okay, so that's a nice big comment now. So it won't interfere with our work. So it said, read two numbers from user input, then print the sum of those numbers. Okay, so let's do this. So I have two numbers. I'm going to just define two variables. I'm going to say num1, and that's going to be an input statement. And I'm going to say num2, and that's going to be another input statement. Let me make this bigger. My apologies. Okay. Now, if I did it just like this, let's, let's just start with this. And then I print think about whether or not this is going to work. So I'm going, let me edit my configuration and do the challenge. So I'm just going to run this and see what happens. So it's just waiting on an input. So I'm going to put 1 and I'm going to put 2 and it gives me 12. But that's not right. 1 plus 2 is not 12. So this is a logic error. 
I have all the syntax is fine. Everything is everything works correctly. The reason I got 12 is because when Python sees two strings and with the plus sign, it's just going to butt them up against each other. So it said, oh, num1 is 1. I'm going to just add num2 to the back of it, and I'm going to give you 12. But that's not what 1 plus 2 is. 1 plus 2 should be 3. So what do I do? What I have to do is I have to correctly type the input. So num1 is supposed to be an integer. So I'm going to force Python to give it the right type. Now I'm not going to do num2 right now because I'm going to run it again. And I'm going to see what the error, because we're going to get an error. So I got 1, and I got 2, and then I get an error here. That error is I have a type error. And it says unsupported operand plus, but hey, plus works. We know it works. Flybooks tells us it works. But you have to read the rest of it. And it says for int and stir. So num1 is an integer. And num2 is still a string. Because this by itself will always be a string. No matter what the value is that you put in it, it's always going to be a string. So if I do the same thing to num1 that I did to num2, and I run it, I'm going to put in 1 and 2, and I get 3. So that's a challenge 1.34 is. It's basically... Um, it's basically just using input and printing output, but it's the type conversion that's really important here. Does that help answer your question? Does that help make it a little easier? Yes. It's adding num1 and num2 together. When it's an integer and it's butting them up against each other when they're strings. And if they're not both the same type, or at least one is a numeric type and the other one is a string, you're going to get an error. You do have to do the conversion. And if you don't do the conversion, then it's not going to work, as we just saw. So are we good? Yes, it can help with the following activities. Remember that types are important. Okay, so no problem. I'm glad you guys stayed around. I am going to now call the lecture, and it will be up on the YouTube channel tomorrow, maybe not till tomorrow evening, along with all of the code that was created tonight um, and a couple other things that we didn't have a chance to talk about. So everybody have a good evening. And I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to stop recording.